know, I refer to South Florida kind of like the Ellis Island of exotic animals. So many animals are imported through this port here. Everything from reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, they all come through Miami. And unfortunately, if they're released here or they escape in Miami, as opposed to being someplace up north where you have very strong climate changes that can detrimentally affect an animal, wipe it out in the first winter, this place is like a club med. So these animals come here, they thrive, they reproduce, and then we have a real issue. So South Florida is different than the rest of the country in that we face much greater challenges because of how inviting this climate is, not just to the people who move down here to get out of the cold, but because of the animals that can thrive. Here. An invasive species would be the lionfish. A lionfish has come in and started to change an environment. It starts to eat uh, native fish. It starts to remove native fish that then causes this domino effect within the ecosystem. They were brought in by the aquarium trade. Uh, this is pretty much accepted that this is how it happened. People had seen them anecdotally a couple of times starting in the early 80s actually. People were, would be diving off of Miami Beach or West Palm Beach and they would see a lionfish here and there. Nobody really took it very seriously. Um, what had happened was there was either one or more releases from people who owned aquariums. They would have these beautiful fish that they bought which were brought in from the Indo-Pacific, Indo very expensive in fact. Um, they would keep them in their aquariums and either when a hurricane would come and they knew they were going to lose power or they just didn't want them anymore for one reason or another, rather than killing them or flushing them down the toilet, they'd dump them into the ocean. So lionfish, like all fish, they don't have internal uh, fertilization, like most fish, I should say. They don't have internal fertilization. So the female lionfish will release a buoyant egg sac, which is actually a little bit unusual for reef fish. Um, it's held together by a mucus that probably has some chemicals in it that make it distasteful to other marine organisms. Um, and then the male will come up and release a sperm that then fertilizes the eggs. Um, this buoyant egg mass can contain anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 eggs, and lionfish can, re can, can produce these egg sacs every three to four days throughout the year. So as you can imagine, one single female can produce a lot of offspring in just a single year. So think about if you're just spawning once a year and you're putting your eggs out there, the currents could be off, the water temperature could be off, there could be predators there to take all of your eggs. But the lionfish is doing it every four days, so they're kind of hedging the risk of those factors working against them. Lionfish get to about 40 centimeters maximum size, and that's about yay big. Um, they eat almost anything they can fit in their mouths. Uh, and this is why they're so harmful to the environment here. The fish that we have in this area have never seen a lionfish before. Over in the, the Indo-Pacific and the Red Sea, things evolved over many millions of years with the lionfish. So they're a natural part of the environment and they're kept in check that way. Here, all the fish are what we call naive. They've never seen a lionfish before. They're not familiar with its hunting techniques and tactics. Um, and to them, it just looks like, I don't know, a big piece of seaweed probably. It's just a voracious predator. It has no natural predators to keep it in check. It grows faster and reproduces sooner than our native species and uh, is having severe detrimental effects on the uh, reef fish assemblages in the park. We can do targeted removals basically in, in confined areas. And what that'll do is that'll keep the lionfish population in these areas in check enough that our native fish populations can still persist. So what we're finding when we're dissecting the fish that we're collecting and um, receiving in all of these derbies is we're finding that there's many different species of native juvenile fish. So they're out on the reefs and they have very um, voracious appetites. There is also um, a netting technique for getting the lionfish um, where you're just taking one net and another net and you're kind of, there's a certain technique to it for sure, but you're just entrapping the lionfish in your two nets. Um, it's much more difficult to handle that. Um, we have the tools, the, the small spears, and uh, the zookeepers is the main thing we use for collecting them. So if you're spearing, you're spearing the fish, you're stuffing the zookeeper, you're moving on. 
if you are netting the fish, um, it's a lot more handling getting your hands close to those venomous spines. Um, but it is important, and there's some protected areas here in the keys where only netting is allowed. Um, so it's a good thing to know how to do. Lionfish are venomous, they're not poisonous. Poisonous refers to a toxin that you would ingest if you ate the animal. Venom refers to a toxin that it delivers to you either through a spine or its teeth or something like that. There's 13 spines on the dorsal. There's two spines on the pelvic, which are right underneath, and then the anal fin on the bottom, they have three spines. So if you cut all of the venomous spines, you can go ahead and fillet the fish just like any other fish. There's been a number of studies done that show that pretty much there's no chance of us ever eradicating lionfish in this part of the world. They're here to stay. Um, that's because they live in such a uh, vast array of habitats. Like I said, their range is all the way from Massachusetts to Brazil. They can't really survive over the winter any further north than North Carolina, so they're a little bit limited by water temperature. But they're found all the way up into estuaries and rivers, so they don't need full seawater. And they're found all the way down to a thousand feet in depth. So this is well beyond where anybody can actually go and fish them. Now the good thing about lionfish, there is one silver lining to this, and that's that they're delicious. So they're as good as any grouper or snapper that you've ever eaten off the reef. They're really, really very tasty. The bad thing that comes along with that is that they won't bite on a hook and line. We've tried a bunch of different trap designs in order to try to trap lionfish. Unfortunately, if you're trapping lionfish, you're trapping every other fish on the reef, so there's nothing that really targets lionfish. So the only good way to remove them is by spearfishing. Most people will go down and just, no, you don't really need a spear gun, they'll just take what's called a pole spear or a Hawaiian sling and go down and, and, uh, and spear these lionfish. It's really the only good way to get them off the reef. The bad thing about that is that this is very labor intensive and it's really not very economically sound. If you wanted to start up a business selling lionfish to, to grocery stores, for instance, um, you'd be spending way more on gas and spending way, much, way more of your time than you should per fish. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of economic sense in the end. When you look at an invasive species and you think about economic impact, I think a perfect example of that is the lionfish. The lionfish coming in now to South Florida and really up a lot of the eastern coast is wiping out key species on our reefs that are important to the sustenance of corals, of the reefs. When those corals die, when those reefs start to die, and the fish start to leave, and South Florida is no longer considered one of the fishing capitals of the world, and you start losing literally millions and millions of dollars in tourism because the fish aren't here the way they used to be, that's when politicians will be paying attention. But then it's too late. That's the big issue. That's the issue I have is that we tend to be so reactionary. Instead of being proactive, listening to science, listening to the predictions that science is giving you, um, saying, listen, we don't stop this now. It's going to wipe out entire reef systems, entire areas where people can be fishing. The future of our fishing industry and our reefs is facing a very, very dangerous future. What seems harmless of introducing one small animal into an environment could be catastrophic. The tegu has the potential to be catastrophic in the sense that one of its favorite foods are eggs. It turns out we have a serious problem with that non-native species here in the south end of Florida. They're not spread out all over Florida. They're spread out over about 20 square miles. And this population is probably a bit more than 30,000. Could be as high as 50,000. Now having said that, that population is pushing itself every day. Um, they, uh, a piece of territory can only support so many tegus. And when it reaches that critical mass, they move again. Tegus have a high metabolism so they have to have food intake to replace that. They're constantly on the move. And what do they like to eat? What is their abundant food supply? <laughs> it is our native species. If the tegu gets into this market, it is going to raid those nests and it's gonna do a huge amount of damage to the crocodile population and the alligator population and the bird population. Here we have rookeries of birds uh, that nest low all over the place throughout the Everglades and the mangroves, places like that. 
the tego will easily adapt, get into those nests and start wiping out those eggs. They'll start wiping out the chicks. They'll start wiping out small mammals. Tegus are voracious feeders. They'll feed on anything. Uh, they can grow to be pretty large, meter long. Uh, they can give you a nasty bite. This is a big problem and people need to pay attention to it now before it becomes a much bigger problem. So tegus have kind of flown under the radar with a lot of the, the lionfish and python publicity that you get, but tegus could be an even bigger problem. We don't lose a single animal like the python. In one feeding, we lose a generation of our natives. And in addition to that, they also eat uh, possums, rats, a lot of your low-end native species that you don't even think about. Now, the state of Florida is killing them as fast as they can. And it's a tragedy, but I can't blame the state for their efforts. It's their job to protect our native species, not to protect the non-native invasives that are killing them. So, like, it's, it's just an ongoing tragedy. And it all comes back to one person released hundreds prior to 2005. And they released them in this, which is best habitat you can ever make for a tegu. So they've been in the wild since 05 and plenty of food, plenty of range. Um, their population is just up, up. They are quite numerous in South Florida, particularly throughout Homestead and Florida City. Pretty much any neighborhood you go through, you can see tegus they're taking over. A single female can lay up to 35 eggs. First off, you cannot capture them by hand. Um, <laughs> Sometimes people from up north come down here and, oh, I want to catch a tegu, and uh, no. I started doing this four years ago, and at the time, I was really the only person that was actively uh, capturing tegus on a large scale. Well, the way I do it is I buy uh, standard live animal capture traps. I modify them quite a bit and I bait them with raw eggs. Two years ago, I spent $7,000 on eggs. And that's not to feed them, that's mainly for bait. As of now, since I started trapping, uh, I'm about 2,400 tegus that I have captured by myself and moved out of this environment. At the end of the day, I feel good about what I do. I am trapping tegus on the same land that my family has hunted and trapped on for over 100 years, right here. And uh, I feel good about the fact that I can remove them from the equation where they're killing off our natives and I can send them to people that have made a conscious decision to have this really cool lizard as a pet. Well, the uh, next big item of concern is iguanas. Now, they've always traditionally had a free ride because they're beautiful, really pretty, showy animals, and the tourists love them, that whole tropical thing. And everybody said, well, they don't really hurt anything. So, well, turns out they do hurt things. Um, they're doing millions probably tens of millions of damage in our canal systems every year. They burrow into the side, eventually that burrow collapse and part of the bank slides into the water and water management has to be sure that in an emergency they can push water out that canal at a given rate. So they have to fix this problem. Every time they get a slide, it, they can't just let it be. And they've been doing that, but nobody's really doing much about the problem, which is the iguanas. Well, there are actually three different species of iguana that are invasive down here, but the green iguana probably comprises like 95% of the individuals down here. Um, homeowners tend to hate them because they come in and eat all of the vegetation on the properties, especially pretty flowers like hibiscus. They love fruit too, so if you have fruit trees, they're gonna come in there and just eat everything and people don't generally like them being there because they're eating and then the aftermath of them eating and pooping everywhere. With regard to iguanas, 
I personally would start to classify them as an invasive species. Uh, main reason being because they wipe out botanical gardens. I mean, uh, I know places like Fairchild down here uh, that have rare endangered plants uh, are having a hard time keeping the iguanas out from keeping from eating all those blooms. If you walk through here in the zoo, you'll be hard pressed to find a hibiscus bush with flowers on it because these iguanas just take every flower off right away. They produce a tremendous amount of fecal material. Uh, they can be vectors for things like salmonella. Um, so I think that iguanas, though they might not be a direct threat to humans, uh, should be classified as an invasive species now because they are affecting the environment in the way they're feeding on flowers, maybe displacing other lizards in that, in that effect. Uh, I don't see them eating any other animals, but their, their effect on the botanical aspect of the environment is profound. You know, peacocks are kind of a, a double-edged sword in a lot of ways. They were originally brought in here as ornamental pets. People like the beauty of the peacock. It's the national bird of India, uh, and it is a beautiful bird. I really like peacocks. I do a bit of photography, so for me it's fantastic to have peacocks around here. So in the afternoons we usually sit here and we go out and I like to take some pictures of them. And while we sit here they just wander around and yeah, it really gives you a, a vacation feel and like you're out in nature while being in the city. Unfortunately, people didn't realize that uh, just by placing a pair in your yard doesn't mean it's going to stay a pair. They're prolific breeders. South Florida is a unique environment here in the continental United States. It's really the only subtropical climate in the continental United States. And it's heaven for peacocks. So peacocks became very uh, well adjusted to this environment. They started reproducing at a great rate. And now really you have a tremendous number of these birds all over South Florida, particularly down in the Coconut Grove area, City of Miami, places like that. And it's creating problems because you have on one hand, you have the people who love to see them. They go out there, they're constantly feeding them. And you have the other people who are having trouble sleeping at night because, you know, these things are going, ah, 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 all night long. They, pretend, they produce a tremendous amount of fecal material. Uh, they will roost many times over cars. That fecal material falls in your car. It burns the paint. Uh, if you have a dark car and you keep it nice and waxed and the birds can see the reflection in it, they will often peck the, the car and they'll make a lot of dings in your car. So they can produce a lot of damage. Uh, the fact of the matter is they are not an, a native species, they don't belong here, and in reality they shouldn't be here. For me it seems like the last 20 years is where it's really erupted. Uh, I've lived in this community now for over 40 years and I don't remember you know, going, uh, when I was going to high school here and then going to college and stuff that I ever, if you saw a peacock, it was like, oh my gosh, there's a peacock, everybody's gonna come to see it because it was like a conversation point. Uh, now the abundance of them is overwhelming and I have seen that occurring within the last 20 years. And that sounds like a long time to most people, but it really isn't in the short span of things, how quickly they, they've reproduced and fill in all these, these environments. So it's very hard to contain an area to keep them from going into the area because they could simply fly into the area. Um, if you have, a pet dog in a yard, in a fenced in yard, that's gonna be a deterrent to peacocks. Foxes will be a deterrent to peacocks. If people see foxes in their neighborhood, they should be elated. Foxes are great animals. I get calls all the time here at the zoo, oh my God, there's a fox in the yard, do I need to be careful? No, be happy. This is an animal that not only controls rodents and other vermin, but will control things like peacocks, especially when they're younger birds. So those, having those native animals around, keeping the habitat as healthy as possible for the broad spectrum of animals that live there. Don't worry about getting rid of the foxes. If you see a big hawk, don't worry about the, the hawk. It's not gonna hurt you. Those animals are there to create a balance. You talk about the chain, the very delicate chain in an environment, in an ecosystem. One link goes, could ruin the whole chain. So these are, these are things people have to understand, you know. I try to equate it, when you look at the wing of an airplane, it's put together by little rivets, right? The plane is flying. All of a sudden you lose one rivet, the plane still flies. Lose another rivet, the plane still flies. Eventually you're gonna lose a rivet that's gonna cause the wing to come off and the whole plane is gonna crash. And it's almost impossible to predict what species represents that rivet that's gonna cause that collapse in the system. At the end of the day, this is gonna affect your quality of life. Whether you like animals, you care about animals, nothing to do with animals itself, it's about a quality of life. And these invasive animals going into an ecosystem and changing them will eventually change and detrimentally alter your quality of life. <laughs>